My guest is Toby Mack. Well, Tom, thank you very, very much for the invitation to join your podcast. It's an honor and privilege. I look forward to sharing my thoughts with your audience and and my subject as one that's very near and dear to our hearts. Um, I'm a president and CEO of the Energy Equipment and Infrastructure Alliance. We are companies that build and operate energy infrastructure, prominently including pipelines and power transmission systems, and our companies are those that build and supply materials and equipment and services to those projects. And so, so one of the things we're focused on very intently right now is, and is very current in policy debates is the subject of permitting. Parts of permitting reform are being debated in the context of the debt ceiling debate, which is very, very current. The HR1, which Speaker McCarthy introduced early in his speakership contained a good bit on permitting reform, and he attached that to the proposal that the Republicans passed to the debt ceiling increase as part of the package. There proceeded to be a negotiation, of course, with the administration. A lot of things got excluded. Some things got included. And what we ended up with over the weekend was a package that included some permitting reforms, but in our opinion, not really addressing the, the core of the problem that uh, that I think needs to be addressed. So, so going into that a little bit, I don't think many people out there, maybe more of your listeners do because they're engaged and active and understand these issues, but I don't think many people in the general public really connect the dots between the need for adequate energy infrastructure, much less new projects to get permitted, and their electric and gas bills and whether the lights come on when they flip the switch. Reliable power generation and deliveries requires natural gas pipelines, gas-fired power plants, electric transmission lines, uh, et cetera, and that generating capacity has got to grow along with rapidly increasing demand for electricity, which we're seeing in our economy as everything gets electrified and data centers get built and expanded and more and more ways to use electricity and more batteries to charge, there's a tremendous increase in the demand for electricity. A problem is that in order to build out the capacity to supply that electricity, you've got to build new capacity. And to build new capacity, in almost every case, you need to get a rather Byzantine, labyrinthine series of permits, both from federal and state governments, to be able to break ground and complete these infrastructure projects, such as pipelines. And in fact, the because of the opposition, particularly to fossil fuel generated energy, the opposition to that has become very skilled and resourced at challenging that permitting process and gaming it to prevent these projects from, from getting built. And we've seen example after example of that play out in the recent past. The federal, and most of these permits as begin at the federal level. they are permits for endangered species habitat. they are permits to cross federally owned lands, such as national forests and just other federal property. they are permits to cross water bodies. they are permits to just simply permits to be able to undertake the construction for these projects. These are massive infrastructure projects typically going into the billions and billions of dollars and they all employ tens of thousands of people when they get underway and so they're very, very important con contributors to employment economic opportunity and uh, and local economies the primary review well, at least one of the first primary re review levels when one of these projects is getting proposed is what they call a NEPA review the national environmental policy act which requires that any major project that has going to have any impact on the environment undergo a, an environmental review by, by the government. So the government undertakes what they call a NEPA review that results in an environmental impact statement, or in some cases, an environmental assessment, which is a little less rigorous. And in the past, the, these environmental reviews have, have taken, I think, an average of about four and a half years to complete. So literally when a project developer goes through all of the upfront design and engineering costs to spec out a project to be able to even submit it 
to the government for a review. They've already invested hundreds of millions of dollars, typically, before submitting the project for this environmental review. Then they sit on their hands for four and a half years while the government pours through the, the application and then goes through a rigorous public comment period. And by the way, that's when the opposition you know, stands up and, and tries to throw monkey wrenches into the project. The anti-fossil fuel folks that are doing this, in our view, climate extremists, they know that if you can't move the oil or gas out of the producing basins, typically the shale basins in Appalachia, Texas, Colorado, and other places around the country, if you can't move the product out of those basins, the producers can't, uh, can't produce it. And so production gets curtailed, nothing is added to supply, and the environmentalists are happy that they prevented more fossil fuel energy from entering our, our, our energy systems. And so that's the game that they're playing. And they game the permitting system to, to stretch these review process timelines out as far as they can, because what we've seen and what they know is that the longer they can delay the, the inception of construction of a project, the more it's going to cost the developer. And we've seen some really egregious examples in the recent past where they've, they've stretched out these timelines past the point where the project is economic and the project sponsors have simply canceled the project. A, a great example uh, is the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which would have brought uh, billions of uh, cubic feet per day of gas out of the Marcellus and Utica uh, shale basins into markets in Virginia and North Carolina and even South Carolina. And when they proposed that project about eight years ago, it was going to cost them, I think, about $4 billion. By the time they cleared their last permitting hurdle, uh, the project was up to $8 billion because of all the additional investment they had to make clearing those hurdles and, of course, the dynamic of, of the passage of time adding cost through inflation. And so project got up to that level, up to twice what they had originally envisioned it, and it became uneconomic. And so they simply pulled the plug on it. They just walked away from all that investment and said, it's just not, it, it doesn't look like this is going to, you know, be a, a, a bankable economic model. And so they canceled the project. And Tens of thousands of workers had to go home. I mean, it was really a catastrophe. We saw the same thing happen with the Penn East pipeline that was running from northeastern Pennsylvania gas fields into southeastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Almost exactly the same scenario played out. And after about five years in a Supreme Court case, which they won, the sponsor pulled the plug on the, on the project. Now, the, the mechanism that the opponents tend to use most aggressively is the judicial system. Permitting agencies, permitting bodies in the federal government go through what they believe to be a rigorous and adequate, you know, complying with the law, a process of evaluating these applications for new projects and their environmental impacts and the developers' methods and, and processes for mitigating those impacts, and then issue the permits. And then that immediately what happens is that an environmental group Food and Water Watch, Southern Poverty Law, you know, on and on, the whole, the, the whole menu of, you know, who they are, will start suing. They'll challenge the permit in the federal court system. And then once they do that, once, once a challenge is, is made, typically in a federal district court, it takes X number of months for the court to review it and issue an opinion. And if it's an adverse opinion, which it often is, then the developer will appeal that to the the appeals level, the courts of appeal around the country. And then that takes another maybe year to go through that process. And if it, if it again comes out adverse, then it could go to the Supreme Court, which is another year worth of litigation. So it's really a, they know this process very well and they game it and they do things that have been tried and true in the past. And they have essentially killed project after project. But what's even more insidious about that is that not, they're not just killing existing projects. What they're doing is they're creating a, a huge disincentive for developers to propose new projects because they, the developer knows that they're facing, you know, just countless obstacles and, and incredible costs to, to overcome these challenges. And they say, the, the heck with it. We'll just operate the infrastructure that we've already got in place. 
and we recognize the almost near impossibility of adding to that infrastructure. So that's that's kind of the status quo on permitting and 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 why there are very very few pipeline projects, uh, either for natural gas or liquids, petroleum products and things like propane and et cetera, on the drawing boards right now because developers simply can't see an economic clear path forward to getting them designed and built. So with that being the status, many wise heads in our government understand and are trying to reform, rectify that, that situation and reform the permitting process to do a couple of things. The kind of the first thing on the reformers hit list is to shorten the time and provide a mandate time limits on the amount of time that the reviewing agencies in the federal government can take to review the application. And although it's you know required under the National Environmental Policy Act, there's no single agency that automatically gets all of these things in their inbox. It could be any number of agencies, and there's usually multiple agencies, the Department of the Interior, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Forest Service, on and on and on, you know, an alphabet soup of agencies and government. And they all get these applications at the same time. And so each one of them initiates a process. So one of the reforms we're looking for is is having these these applications be reviewed only by one federal agency uh, that would then coordinate with the others, but be the lead agency and be responsible for conducting the process themselves and not having to wait for other agencies to perform the process, often which were sequential rather than concurrent. So that's that stretched things out. So that's one that's one area that we're advocating for. The second is actually putting a a time limit on the length of time these reviews can take place. And the the current advocacy is for an absolute limit of two years on an environmental review, again, rather than the four and a half or more that it's taken on average in the past for an environmental impact statement and for an environmental assessment, which is an environmental review on a project that has less impact on the environment, a maximum of one year. There's also an effort to mandate that that these review documents that are produced for the review have some kind of literally a page limit on them. The environmental impact statements typically coming out of the federal agency and responsible can go up above a thousand pages. And so the reform effort right now is to put a cap on pages that these things can consume. And the cap right now is 150 pages. So so we think those are uh, th- those are great starts to the reform project process. The debt ceiling, back to the debt ceiling bill and the negotiation, all of those reforms that I had just gone through are included in the debt ceiling bill. And apparently they were signed off on by the Biden administration. They probably choked on that and did it reluctantly, knowing they were going to get clobbered by the left, and they will be, and they are being. But they did sign off on them because the Republican negotiators had a lot of leverage and they insisted on these things. But the thing that is missing from that reform package uh, is the thing that in our view is is most important, and that is judicial reform. Reform of the system that permits project opponents to challenge and delay and sue and, and litigate against permits that are issued. Sometimes permits that are issued get they get challenged retroactively. Sometimes permits are challenged by the by the challenger challenging the process by which the review was undertaken, the rigor uh, by which it was done, et cetera, et cetera. And so, the biggest reform that we see is needed to unblock so much needed infrastructure is to set limits on those judicial challenges, require that they be done expeditiously, that they be undertaken in just a single court or court of appeals that that has jurisdiction and and that's what's missing from this package and so we think that that we're going to have to continue the fight after this debt ceiling thing comes down whichever way it comes down and who knows because it's very much in play right now and the, and even the reforms that I mentioned that are in the finally negotiated package they could not survive we fully anticipate we're going to be at the you know at the at the reform bar for the foreseeable future because of the reforms that aren't in it and the reforms that 
we think are going to get challenged. So, so the other thing that's in the debt limit agreement is, and some people may have seen this, is the kind of the legislative mandating of approval of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which is a, a natural gas pipeline that goes from West Virginia into Virginia, carries a huge amount of natural gas from uh, producing shale fields in southwestern Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Ohio into markets in the farther south. Th this is another example of a project that was proposed probably six years ago, budgeted at about $3 billion. They actually cleared some of the permitting hurdles and and started construction and it's a 300 mile project and it crosses mountain ranges and valleys and creeks and streams and rivers as you might suspect in that region the the project actually went under construction and the majority of it has been built so it's been sitting there in the ground about 95 percent complete and that's been the status quo for about the last two and a half years it's been sitting there almost completely done but lacking a couple of permits to cross some national forest and some other areas where the, where the permits to make those crossings were challenged successfully in court. What this deal does, if it survives, will say that, that all of those challenges, it just legislatively declare that all of those challenges are invalid and that all necessary permits to finish the pipeline are hereby mandated to be put in place. So kind of an end run around the permitting process by the Congress. It seems that, and this was a big factor in the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which I described earlier, that had to cross all these permitting barriers and succeeded in many of them. Uh, the problem has been in the Richmond Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a liberal court of appeals, liberal majority, and they have systematically ruled against just about every permit to build a pipeline in their jurisdiction, which is West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, and some other areas. And so so they've been the one blocking these projects, and this congressional action would essentially invalidate those legal challenges. So so I guess the, the, the nine yards here is that, you know, even with all of the provisions in the debt ceiling that reform the permitting process, even if they are to pass into law, we're still going to have a huge advocacy effort ahead of us to get past these other permitting challenges and permitting problems uh, that are not addressed in the in the reform bill. So there's where we are. It's a very difficult environment. And as, as I said before, almost no new projects are on the drawing boards. If we can turn the status quo around and improve the environment for permitting, I think you'll see developers start to spec out new projects. The point of producers not being able to produce, therefore consumers not being able to consume, is very, very vividly demonstrated in Appalachia. These, the, the richest natural gas fields in our country and have, some of the richest in the world are in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. And in fact, the producers that operate in that region, drilling and producing, cannot increase production beyond its current level because there is no pipeline takeaway capacity that can take any additional natural gas than what is already being produced. So I think it will take, it'll, if we can get reform in place, it's still going to take a while for developers to envision, spec, engineer, and develop applications for those projects to be submitted through a reformed permitting process. And that, of course, takes years. So, you know, I think it's a ways away, but we've got to start somewhere. And permitting reform is, is, is where we think that the biggest opportunity to change the status quo is. When people are blocking these pipelines, what is their number one reason? Is it climate hysteria that they think the pipelines are going to cause bad weather? Is that it? Oh, absolutely. The, the pipelines enable the combustion of fossil fuels, natural gas, oil, propane, and all the other liquids that are produced in these producing regions. And their end objective is to stop any consumption of fossil fuel because of carbon emissions and other emissions that they claim are killing the planet and killing children and doing all of the other bad things that they claim for it. But yeah, that's their agenda. They, they're very smart. They know. And 
have been very effective. They know that stopping a pipeline will stop production and it will stop consumption. If you, if you want to stop that stuff, step on the hose in the middle of the process. Who do you see as doing most of the blocking? Like, is Mike Bloomberg and Bill Gates, are they heavily behind this, or who is behind it? I think they're funding the organizations that are doing most of it. They're providing a lot of the funding to these environmental radical organizations. Uh, at the head of that list is the Sierra Club. You can almost always find their name on as party to these legal actions. Food and Water Watch is up there, Friends of the Earth. It, you know, it's just an on and on. You know, rogues gallery of organizations that are doing this. Who do you see as the biggest friends of real reliable energy, maybe on the Republican side or, or who, which politicians are on your side? Oh boy, it's, it's a long list. You know, you look at almost any, you know, re Republican or conservative. And, and by the way, there are, there are some on the D side, but not many. Senator Manchin is, of course, at the head of that list. But on the, on the R side, if you look at the members of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Pretty much all of the Republican members of those committees are strong advocates for the importance of fossil fuels. On the House side, if you look at House Energy and Commerce, you, you'll see many, many Republican members of the Energy and Commerce and their subcommittees being strong advocates for energy, and they have good reason to be. I mean, it, it, you know, we, as I said before, demand continues to grow and supply is not adequate to the task. And renewables, wind and solar can, can no way make up the difference between, you know, what we've got and what we're going to need and what even what we need now that has huge problems with reliability. Pretty soon you're going to see, you know, you're, you're going to see grid failures, I think, as the summer comes up. Affordability, energy security, all of those things that that adequate exploitation of our fossil fuel assets prevents from happening. So we're we, we've got a lot of allies. There are a lot of there are a lot of opponents. I mean, as you know, the you know the politically the Congress is split down the middle, and so that's why these things become so contentious. And you've got the bully pulpit in the White House that is uh, set to exercise the veto power over anything that does emerge from Congress if he doesn't like it, or if his if his liberal left supporters tell him that he shouldn't like it. What are you thinking as you look out to the 2024 election? Do you think if DeSantis were to get in there or, or Trump, that the things would get better for you? Oh, there's, there's no question about it. I mean, when, when Trump was president, was measure after measure supporting increased use of, of natural gas and, and petroleum products went through the system and blocks were removed at the Environmental Protection Agency. That I mean, One of the problems is that the president populates all of these regulatory agencies with zealots, and the zealots then implement their agenda in opposition to fossil fuels. And so, you know, it, it cascades down from the top. But but when you have a president like Trump's DeSantis or whoever it ends up in the office in 2024, we hope you'll see a complete set of regulators heading for the exit and a complete set of new ones coming in. And you know, we really enjoyed working with the regulators that President Trump put in place in the last administration. They really got it. They were really cooperative. They knew where uh, the regulatory levers were, and they exercised those levers. And we had we had energy abundance, and we had energy affordability, and we had energy independence and energy security, and all of that's being reversed. Okay. So I think, yeah, so I think 2024 is a is a great opportunity, and whoever ends up in there. If it's a Republican, you're going to see a lot of this stuff start to correct. But we can't we can't just sit around and hope that happens. We've got to continue to fight. As far as getting a pipeline built, is this by far the worst environment you've ever seen? Like during the Obama administration, was that a little bit more friendly or not? Oh, my gosh. We were building pipelines hand over fist back in those days through the Trump administration. An enormous amount of capacity got built. It, it was pretty much, I don't want to say a perfunctory process, but it was a predictable process. This one that that the project sponsors, the folks that would, would own and operate these projects, they knew how the process was going to play out, and they operated inside that permitting environment very efficiently and effectively. And just about every every project that got proposed ended up getting built. Now some of them were built with modifications from the original design based on environmental reviews, et cetera. But agencies like the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, National, the, the Council on Environmental Quality, 
and others that are key in the process understood that we needed to build this infrastructure and they did not stand in the way. And by the way, the, the opposition groups weren't as well organized as they are now. So uh, because of the funding that's flowed to those groups, enormous funding that's flowed to those groups, they become far more effective and far more prevalent in the process. We talked earlier a few months ago that I think you said the Keystone pipeline is dead. It's permanently dead. Can't be revived. Or... The Keystone XL pipeline. Yes. Okay. It, its sponsor, its developer was TC Energy. And TC Energy, once this last cancellation occurred, they said, that's it. We're done. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And so there, that's, you know, there was a, an enormous amount of pipe that had been laid out across the right of way, an enormous number of permits that had been secured. Enormous amount of actually some construction that had already been undertaken. Deals with end users had been done. They said, sorry, we can't do this. And they just shut it down and walked away. So no, it's not, it's not a revivable. You would have to start from scratch, literally, to re-engineer the project and, and get it re-permitted. All those permits, by the way, have time limits. And so, so much time has gone by that they're, you know, any of the permits that they did have have probably expired by now. So as the pipelines continue to get blocked, is there any ways kind of around it, shipping over land or LNG, et cetera? Uh, no, that didn't work. It's extremely more expensive and inefficient to carry crude oil by rail car. Now that's what's happening. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of crude has gone across the rails. It's way less safe. It's far more accident prone, far less efficient, far more costly. And when you think of it, if you're taking a unit train, which is 100 tank cars, which is the typical unit of, of shipment by rail, from Hardesty, Canada, which is where the terminals are for the oil sands, down to the Gulf Coast, which is where the demand centers are, you have to, you have to load a train, take it 2,000 miles south, unload it and then deadhead it back up to Hardesty empty because there's nothing, there's no return product that's going north. And, and then you, and then when you, you can, we ran this calculation a while ago, when you run the numbers on how much diesel exhaust gets burned by the locomotives hauling this stuff back and hauling the empty trains back north, enormously more emissions result from rail transport than would result from pipelines. And the pipeline operators, you know, trying to trying to comply with, you know, needs for lowering their emissions, you know, they've converted a lot of their pumping stations and their compressor station pumping stations in the case of liquids and compressor stations in the in the case of gas to electric driven or some something other than, you know, fossil fuel engine powered compressors and pumps. And so they've taken the They've taken the carbon footprint, if you will, of, of, of these pipeline systems down to much lower levels. And so when you compared that to, to, to the emission profile of a rail transportation network, it's just vastly lower, forgetting the, the, the very important safety aspects of the potential for you know, rail disasters, derailments, and so forth. Do you see Berkshire Hathaway at all as having any incentive to get behind green hysteria because they make so much money off of wind power and they make so much money hauling stuff around on trains? Any opinion on that? You know, you know what? I, I don't. As a matter of fact, uh, Berkshire Hathaway has a, a, a tremendous footprint in pipelines. When Dominion pulled the plug on the Atlantic Coast Pipeline Project, and, and Dominion is a, basically a Virginia utility, because at the time the Virginia government was mandating that Dominion transition to all renewables, Dominion was sitting on thousands and thousands of miles of natural gas pipeline through, not just through Virginia, but through the Southeast and the middle Atlantic states and actually out West. And when they, they saw the handwriting on the wall because they primarily operate in Virginia, they packaged all of that pipeline infrastructure up and sold it to Berkshire Hathaway, which is now operating. And it, very few people realize this, but I think Berkshire Hathaway is actually moving something like about 20% of the natural gas that is moving through pipelines in this country. So they have a big stake in, in, in things that support pipeline capacity. And yeah, you can say that, you know, they've got BNSF and they haul a lot of crude by rail, but, but I, I just personally don't believe that 
that the company was behind the demise of Keystone XL. I just don't think that make, would make any sense at all for them. And besides climate hysteria, what is the like the number one or two reason why people oppose natural gas? Do they think that they're going to turn on their faucet and they're going to be able to light the uh, <laughs> light the gas on fire out of their faucet, or what are they thinking? Well, that you know that was a I, that that was an, a, a manufactured crisis in in Pennsylvania where you know some people actually saw methane coming out of their faucets. But as it turns out, that methane was really ambient methane in the ground because there's so much natural gas in the ground. There's some of it just naturally exists, and it it leaches into into water the water wells, and then make, can come up with the so so that that was that was a phony, in my opinion, you know, a phony situation. So the other thing that that I think the opponents of natural gas try to stir up fear with is, is, you know, explosions. And yes, there have been some incidents where, where natural gas pipelines have ruptured and there have been fires and so forth. Most of those occur in remote areas and don't result in any, you know, injury or significant damage, but every now and then one happens in a municipal system. And so that gets a lot of, that gets a lot of press. And so you, that gives the opposition a poster child for why these things aren't safe. But in fact, the, the safety record of natural gas pipelines is is incredibly exemplary. I think I don't know the exact number, but it's point nine 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 something safe. And but but the opposition never fails to exploit a, an incident to instill fear in the general public. That and usually they they use also use that more importantly to raise money. And you know when you think about this, a lot of the anti fossil fuel advocacy. And the groups that undertake it are really in the business of raising money. And so, you know, they'll use any mechanism that they think can support and ask for contributions. Okay. Last time we talked, you were talking about the natural gas situation in Europe. It looked like they were going to run out of natural gas, but by the end of the winter, they had plenty. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, the, of course, when when, when they divorced themselves from supplies from Russia, they immediately had a crisis of supply. And so they were started looking for additional supplies. They got very, very aggressive in buying LNG, a lot of it from the United States. And they proceeded to fill their storage caverns as aggressively as they possibly could. And, you know, typically what happens is that yeah, during the summer, when you're not using natural gas for heating or as much power generation, you fill these vast underground storage caverns with inventory that you then burn in the colder winter months when you need more generation. And so to their great credit, they scoured all the corners of the earth for natural gas supplies and filled their reservoirs up to brimming full and then had sort of a warm winter. And and then as it turns out, they're up to their eyeballs in natural gas, which we think is a wonderful thing. You may have seen the the market price of LNG has taken a, a significant tumble. The market price of natural gas, which had spiked incredibly, I mean, beyond levels that we can even envision in this country, I think it had gotten up to something like $300 per million BTU or 1,000 cubic feet. Uh, just numbers that don't even relate. I mean, in, in our country, it's $3. And they had spiked up to like 300 Now, all of that is kind of backed back out of the system, not to say... That won't happen again if they get a particularly cold winter next winter and run out of supplies. And if we don't get some more LNG terminals built in this country, which is another issue, by the way, that's very important to you know global energy supplies and global energy security. If we can't get these LNG terminals built, that's going to be to the detriment of global supply adequacy. We've got a bunch of LNG terminals, some under construction, but we've got a whole tranche of projects that have been fully permitted, by the way, but that can't get financing to be built. And an enormous amount of export capacity could be added if they could be built. And one of the reasons, and I'll emphasize this, that some of these projects are having trouble getting financed is because financial institutions are looking out in the future and saying, well, geez, if, you know, if, if, if we really do go all green or all renewables at some point in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, we're not going to need all this LNG export capacity. And so we don't want to give you a 30-year financing package for a piece of 
infrastructure that may only have a you know, only have a an economic life of 15 years, and so they've been reluctant to finance. The other thing that they're looking at is where are these export terminals going to get all that gas? You know, they've got to be fed with supplies. And you've got, you know, right now, the ones that are operating, and I think for the most part, the ones that are under construction will be coming online in the next couple of years, are, are getting their supplies from northern Louisiana and from Texas, from the Permian Basin and the Eagle Ford Shale Play. But at some point, you know, if we're going to double or triple, which we can, our LNG exports, they're going to have to get gas from you know where, the Appalachian Basin. And if you can't build a pipeline out of the Appalachian Basin, you can't get that gas to the export terminals, all of which pretty much are on the Gulf Coast. So so that's another reason why, you know, blocks to building takeaway infrastructure out of the Appalachian Basin are having a profound effect, not just on our market, but on global markets. Okay, I'm just trying to envision the map of the U.S. And I guess Texas is a friendly place to get natural gas because at least they let you build pipelines. So you could yep. build LNG facilities there and ship LNG from there, I guess. And they are. There's yeah. there's a lot of LNG export capacity already operating out of Texas, Corpus Christi, particularly then up on the Gulf Coast and into Louisiana. You've got, you know, you've got half of the capacity just about in Louisiana and the other half in Texas. And and again, they're getting their natural gas supplies from intrastate sources, the Haynesville Shale in Louisiana and the Permian and the Eagleford in, in Texas. And the key there is that an intrastate pipeline, one that's just wholly within a state, has a very much easier permitting process to undertake because this is entirely uh, state controlled. And Louisiana and Texas are very friendly to natural gas and fossil fuels. And so getting a getting a big pipeline put in place you know, to, to go from northern Louisiana to southern Louisiana is, is infinitely easier than one that is inter, interstate. Because once it becomes interstate, then the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission gets a piece of it and on and on and on. And so you go down the you go down the permitting rat hole that, that we've been talking about so far. Does your organization do anything with nuclear power? We do not. We're fans of it. We think it's an essential ingredient to the to the energy mix, the energy portfolio going forward. We're very well aware that the same cast of characters that are opposing fossil fuels also oppose nuclear. They, they think nuclear is another another source of power that could threaten the economic viability of wind and solar. But yet, nuclear is you know it's base load power. If we can get past the permitting challenges for building nuclear capacity, the same way we need to get past permitting challenges for fossil fuel capacity, a lot of that could come online. And of course, with the new generation that we he we see coming of small modular reactors, numerous smaller plants that are a lot easier and cheaper to build and operate, that could, could and will be, I think, a very, very important part of our energy mix. Does your organization give billions of dollars to this climate <laughs> denial machine that Michael Mann fantasizes about? <laughs> <laughs> Being a graduate of Penn State, I'm I'm ashamed to admit that sometimes that that, that he is operates from my alma mater. No, we don't give money to those guys. They don't need our money either. They've got ample uh, resources from the Bloomberg's and the Rockefellers of the world, and they're just covering that are just covering them up with you know, whatever they need. And then, you know, Bezos is in that mix too now. And and his ex-wife who walked away with, you know, umpteen billions of dollars, she's all in. It's just an enormous funding machine that so far out funds what industry is being, as, is able to put up to fight back their challenges. And that's unfortunate, but that's the world we live in. We hear that Exxon, for example, is supposed to be funding climate skeptics right now, but, but I haven't seen any evidence that they've done at all in, in recent years, have they? No, yeah. they're actually, no, I, I can't imagine it. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I know that that company has been a stalwart operator of, of, of fossil fuel production and infrastructure and, and the petrochemical end, the downstream end, so refining and so forth. So they're a very, very key class player in the in the energy mix. Do you think people in your industry spend a lot of time thinking about this whole climate issue that the products that they're working on are going to make the weather worse? 
They no, they don't think that these products are going to make the weather worse. They they think they're going to they're going to enable human beings to thrive, and that that the those humans on the planet that that live in energy poverty are are going to be able to be lifted out of that poverty by these products, particularly and importantly by LNG. There's a great number. There's a guy. There's a, a fellow down at the University of Texas by the name of Dr. Scott Tinker, and he's got a great. He's he's got an absolute. He, he heads up a UT uh, energy resource study organization, and he loves to quote the statistic that the that his refrigerator consumes four times more electricity annually than the average resident of Tanzania or some, one of those countries mm -hmm. in Africa. And so, and so that just dramatizes, you know, the, the, the incredible challenge of energy poverty. And when you have, you know, 2 billion people in the world that are basically, basically cooking indoors with coal and dung and wood and all of the, all of the indoor pollution that that creates and all the children that die as a result of it, I think three and a half million kids die a year of, of the effects of uh, indoor pollution from using you know, those kinds of fuels inside the cook. Energy poverty is a huge issue for, for if you really care about human flourishing and, and health and safety and, and the ability of others to enjoy some of the things that we're blessed with, you would want to supply those people with as much natural gas as we can possibly liquefy and get over there. And believe me, they'd find a way to use it. So that's, that's another key part of the argument that you don't hear the other side acknowledging. They just gloss over it. And the other thing that the, you, you hear them not saying is, okay, so if we were to somehow miraculously, you know, spend tens of trillions of dollars in this country to become net zero, you know, which is the state administration climate goal, it would have almost no impact on global emissions. And the reason is because China and India are emitting almost half of the, of, of the global emissions profile. And we're, you know, we're approaching 10% of it. So we go to zero. And it has no impact on if 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 CO two emissions have any impact on climate, going to net zero here is not going to move the needle. They don't they don't acknowledge that case. If they were really consistent and true to their philosophy and their passion for what they believe in, they'd be over in Beijing, not here in our in in Washington D.C. But obviously, that's not happening. I'm a big fan of the work of Alex Epstein. I think he does a good job of laying out this yeah. case. Don't you think the Exxons of the world could do a little bit more of laying out this case and saying, look, the product we're producing is doing great things and we're proud of it. And not, we're, we're not just a, a little bad. We're, we're doing a great thing for everyone. Yeah. I, I think they do say that. I think yeah. organizations like API say it endlessly. I, I think that the the opposition has a, has a fun time trying to demonize those those voices. I think that really the most effective voices in this debate are the workers and the consumers whose whose lives and whose families and whose communities depend on these projects and on adequate energy supplies. Those are the voices we need to hear from more. The, 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 the energy producers, I think, do as good a job as they can. But again, they, the, you know, the, the opposition is, 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 is very good at demonizing them as simply profiteering at the expense of the health of our children, which is a false statement, of course, but they make it. And it resonates with some people, unfortunately, and some politicians. Do you have any thoughts on ESG or DEI? Is that a big deal in your world right now? <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of thoughts about them, but I think I'll leave that alone. <laughs> uh, but thanks for asking. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Any other points you'd like to make before we wrap up? I think just the bottom line here is that the country has politically and in in the general population have got to get comfortable with the fact that fossil fuels are their friend and it's an enormous asset for our country and for our standard of living that we are blessed so far beyond just about every region on earth with our natural gas and oil resources they're they're cheap they're easy to produce they're reliable and they're affordable and helping people understand that that they are such an enormous asset to the average American that other countries don't enjoy. And here we are with people on the left trying to demonize that wonderful advantage for, for no reason, for no, for no legitimate reason that's going to have any impact whatsoever on climate or environment.
Very good. So thanks a lot for being on the podcast and I hope to talk to you next time. Toby Mack. Tom, thank you very much. It was a pleasure.